I'm standing in the church of St. Mary Magdalene, Geddington. The church was built over 1,000 years ago in the Saxon period. Before me are the arches added later by the Normans, but above the Norman arches there's the original arcading, the decoration of that original Saxon church. Behind me here is a doorway which once led to a royal hunting lodge in the north of this churchyard. The hunting lodge was used over a period of 150 years by kings and queens of England. Come with me on a journey back in time to the year 1290 on this very day. The church, the arcading, the Norman arches and the doorway leading to the hunting lodge were then as they are now. Only the characters have changed. Come with me on that journey. So 
soft and clean. I tell you what, it'd be better than my old straw mat. Oh, well. <laughs> Be with you. About your work, my good woman, there is much to do. The king, accompanied by the queen consort and the court, is visiting his royal manor at Geddington to hold a parliament at the palace, which is but a few steps away to the north. During their 36 years of happy and loving wedlock, Eleanor has borne Edward 15 children. But only six have been spared to this day. The heir, Edward, is the last born. He was birthed at Carnarvon in April 1284. Today is the 31st of August, 1290. The year began happily for the royal family. Christmas and Yuletide were spent at Westminster. February and March saw them at Queen Eleanor's Manor and Forest of Beckenham in Worcestershire. In April, the family had a conference with Eleanor of Provence at Ainsley after spending Easter at Woodstock. They discussed the proposed betrothal of son Edward to the infant Margaret, Queen of Scotland. Our king also made arrangements for his succession should he fail to return from his next crusade. On the 30th of April, their daughter, Joan of Acre, was married to Gilbert Clare, Earl of Gloucester, and on the 8th of July, their second daughter, Margaret, was married to John, heir of Brabant. Quite a few days ago, at Northampton Castle, a treaty for the marriage between Edward and Margaret of Scotland was ratified. In this way, our noble King Edward hopes to ensure peace between England and Scotland. At this very moment, our King is relaxing in his favourite fashion, hunting in the forest of Rockingham, which surrounds us. On his return, he will hold a parliament at the hunting lodge. His business is to include giving the incumbent, Imbert of, of Genoa, permission to travel abroad until a year after Michaelmas. Roger de Bello Fago and Ralph, Abbey of Geddington, have been nominated to fulfill his duties. On the morrow, the king will continue his journey to the manor of Clipstone, where he will hold the Michaelmas parliament. Hush! The Queen approaches. <laughs> of Egypt in the year of our Lord, 1,271. Oh, madam, how brave! So you remember? Yes, the king was tricked and attacked by a Saracen, but his majesty bravely fought him off and then killed him. Our dear king was stabbed with a poison dagger, and you, my lady, saved his life by sucking out the poison with your own lips. Thank God! I saved my beloved Edward's precious life, but I lost the babe that I bore. 
Yes, and in that same year, whilst you were abroad with the king, our dear Prince John, heir to the throne, died here in England. Oh, ma'am, life has been so unkind to you. All those precious babies you lost. Enough! No more sorrowful talk. Come, minstrels, cheer us up with some joyful news. <laughs>
Are you well rested, my love? These few quiet moments in this beautiful church have refreshed me a little. But I must confess that of late I have been feeling somewhat weary in body and spirit. Ah, uh, but your pallor these last few days has worried me. I will get my physician to attend you. Do not fret yourself, my dearest. When you are by my side, my spirit lives and I am at peace. But if my physician will not attend you, are you well enough for the feasting? Of course, my love. My place is always by your side. Good. In that case, we will away to the palace. My uh, stewards tell me that the uh, wine cellar has been restocked again. Knowing the capacity for wine that our lords have, I am sure they will need further supply for more. I'm sure. so well seems now to be causing our king much concern. Suddenly, on 7th of October, tragedy struck. The Bishop of St Andrews wrote to the king, telling him of the mysterious death of the Queen of the Scots. <coughs> she disappeared on her return journey from Norway. This is the end of peace for Scotland. The Bruces and the Ballader are waging war for the Scottish throne. King Edward's hopes are dashed. Edward and Eleanor are on their travels yet again. They have left Clipstone, passed through Laxton, and are crossing the Trent at Marnham on their way to Lincoln. Now at the end of November, the people of England await news of the royal family with fear in their hearts. Father, they do say our beloved Queen be ill with fever. 
Be a true father, is our lady sick? I heard they be at Harvey. They say she be near to death, and the king be by his oh. side night and day. <coughs> Good people of Gaydon, it is true. <gasps> News has reached me that our queen is in articulo mortis. What do that mean, father? At the point of death. <gasps> we must all put our trust in God and pray that he will see fit to restore her to good health. Don Spiro, Spiro, while there's life, there's hope. Let us pray for help from on high. Majesty Eleanor, Queen Consort of England, died at the Manor House Harvey on the 28th day of November, Anno Domini 1290. Her body was taken to Lincoln, where the viscera were buried in the cathedral on Sunday, 3rd of December. After the embalming, the Queen's body is to be taken to Westminster. The cortege has rested at Grantham and is now at Stamford on this, the 5th day of December. Anno Domini 1290. <laughs> Sick transit Gloria Mundi, so passes away earthly glory. Conquiescat in pace, may she rest in peace. Good people, you have heard the news. There is nothing more we can do but pray for the soul of our beloved Queen. Return to your homes and spread the sad news abroad. Messenger, you must be in need of refreshment and rest after your arduous journey. There you are, Father. I see the messenger has brought the sad news. We've made all haste from Stamford to inform you that the normal route due to foul weather and floods has been abandoned. The King has commanded that the cortege is to rest here in Geddington. <laughs> we had ridden ahead. All must be prepared when the King arrives with the Queen's body. Good people, you have heard the news. There is much to do. We must prepare to receive the body of our Queen. I will toll the bell and let all the people know. Pake to it. By your Lord. 
The sad day has dawned. Today, the 6th of December, the body of Eleanor, Queen Consort, will soon be arriving here at Kenya to rest in the church of St. Mary Magdalene on her, way, on her final journey to Westminster. The church and royal palace await the king and cortege. All through the night, the villagers have been preparing meats and vegetables to feed the large number of courtiers who accompany the king. Hark, the muffled beat of drums heralds the arrival of the mourners. Let all mortal flesh be silenced, and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth is Oh, 
Hermanus Obiscum. The Lord be with you. Through the long hours of the night, the guards have kept their vigil. Those closest to the Queen have also spent the night here in prayer around the bier. As dawn breaks, so the villagers will arrive to pay homage to their beloved Queen. ensure that future generations know of this our undying love for each other. At every town and place where your body on this last sad journey rests, I shall cause a cross of cunning workmanship to be erected in memory of you, Ellen, most virtuous and modest. generations will know of her love, beauty, and understanding. Send the Queen's executors to me. It shall be done, my King. Fame semper viva. May her fame live forever. <coughs> Amen to that.
Silently, throughout the long night, courtiers and common folk alike have kept vigil over the body of their beloved queen. Silently, they left to weep and to recall happier times. The king has commanded that architects and stonemasons be brought before him. Even now, they hasten to Geddington to do his bidding. When all is arranged, the cortege will continue its sad journey to Westminster, resting next at Northampton. Dawn at last. I must be about my business.
my liege. The Queen's executors, Robert Burnell, Bishop of Bath, Chancellor Henry de Lacy, Earl of Lincoln, and Keeper of the Queen's wardrobe, John of Berwick, have arrived. Are you ready to receive them? Indeed. Show them to me. <coughs> My liege, we have received your summons and made all haste to attend you. What to your commands? Arise, and uh, now to business. At every resting place of my dear dead queen's body, I propose that monumental crosses be erected to her memory. Here at Gettington, it will be built at the clearing by the junction of the three roads. In order that travellers may stop and offer up prayers to my Abbey, most gorgeous, and noble. You favour a triangular shape, my liege. This will enable it to be seen on all three sides. I envisage the monument as a beautiful and elegant structure, richly ornamented. I calculate that the cross will be approximately 40 to 42 feet high, rising from a platform of hexagonal shape, led up to by seven steps. It is to be carved with the arms of Castile and Leon and Ponthieu, as well as the three passant gardons of England. The three statues of the Queen in lamentation shall be carved with her exact likeness, each wearing a coronet and with flowing drapery. I see that I can leave my plans in good hands. Money is of no importance. It must be uh, well designed, though, and of the very best materials, but spare no effort in time to build it. We propose to use the superior stone from the nearby quarries of, Geld, of Stanion and Weldon. With your permission, we have the stonemason from the Weldon quarry. If you approve, that shall be the stone that we use. <coughs> stonemason, let the king inspect your stone. And you are the mason who will design the cross. Well done. Thank you very much. We are pleased. The cross at Gellington shall be the finest and most durable of all. This we pledge, my king. So be it. In generations to come, people will look at the cross and know what an honour. Helen, Queen of England. My liege, all are now assembled. May the noble lords enter and prepare the beer for its journey to Northampton. Yes, well, I ask them to stop at the place where the cross will be built, and you, dear priest, to sprinkle holy water and make your blessing known. Vade in pace, Dominus Fabiscum. By the King's command, a candle is to be lit for every year of the Queen's life. O Father of all, 
we pray to thee for our beloved Queen Eleanor, whom we love but see no longer. Grant her thy peace, let light perpetual shine upon her, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in her the good purpose of thy perfect will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
welcome. A warm welcome to His Worship Mayor of Kettering and Mrs. Gordon. Um, a warm word of welcome to Bishop Simon Fitz and his wife Mary there in the congregation. The explanation why Bishop Simon is here really is that the Bishop of Lincoln at the time of Queen Eleanor's death was Oliver Sutton and he was with her in Harvey when she died and also officiated at the funeral in Westminster Abbey. Um, Bishop Simon is also a member of the family at Bowden House and he's <coughs> staying the weekend with them there. And um, a personal detail really that he was Bishop of Lincoln when I was a student at college and uh, my own feeling is that if he's as good and as kind, half as good and half as kind as we remember him from there, um, then we've had a, a pleasure of coming straight into store. So thank you, Madam, and all welcome to you um, at this uh, church. Please uh, bow your heads while I read the few comments. <coughs> Heavenly Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us a true faith and a sure hope. Strengthen this faith and hope in us all our days, that we may live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please remain seated for the first week. When Edward I was on tour in late 1290, the mood was somber, for Eleanor, with him as always, was ill. Her fever steadily worsened. The court, heading slowly for Lincoln, had to stop at Harvey. There, Queen Eleanor died. For three days, no state business was done, as Edward grieved, his mind full of thoughts of Eleanor of how their childhood marriage, part of the diplomatic game of the time, evolved over 36 years into a rare royal love story. His beloved queen, his constant companion, the two were inseparable. How could she fittingly be remembered? A great cortege would take her to Westminster Abbey, where a magnificent tomb would on each anniversary of her death, be decked with flowers and lit by 100 candles. At every stopping point, a superb cross would be created and passers-by would say a prayer for her soul. So the cortege moved off. The stop at Geddington pointed with memories of happier days spent in the Royal Lodge. For a month after the funeral, Edward, abandoning state affairs, went into retreat. One monastic chronicler wrote of Eleanor, Just as dawn pierces the shadows of night and drives them out, so by her progress through England, this blessed queen drove out the night of faithlessness, anger, and discord. For the royal family, this was true. Edward himself wrote, I loved her tenderly in her lifetime. I shall not cease to love her now that she is dead. The words of Monk Pierce of Longtop capture his grief. His solace was all wrecked since she was gone from him gone. On fell things he thought and waxed heavy as lead. For sadness or through since Eleanor was dead. Here ended the lesson.
reading from the book of the Revelation of St. John the Divine. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water from the fountain of the water of life without pain. And he who conquers shall have this heritage. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs>
words of my lips and the thoughts of our hearts be now and always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's a great honor to be asked to come and preach at this service, and I thank you for your kindly welcome. The story of Edward and Eleanor does seem to have been a love story, doesn't it? With the king punctuating the tale of his grief at its famous stopping places on the long road from Lincoln to London, and later marking his memories with these famous crosses, including yours at Beddington, so that through the clamor of the centuries, with all their tremendous events, we somehow can discern the beating of these two human hearts. And that's quite a rare thing, that we should be able to hear something so personal uh, about someone playing a great part in the life of the nation. In the east wall of the retro choir at Lincoln, consecration of which was attended by <coughs> Eleanor and Edward, there are two stone heads carved. One a man's head wearing a crown, and the other a woman's head in a wimple. And tradition has it that these are portraits of Edward and Eleanor, whose mutual devotion shines so warmly to us through the shadows of history and must shine very specially here in this village, not least as a result of the marvelous pageant that you've all put on and experienced. <coughs> we tend, to, don't we, not to get these glimpses into the, the humanity of historical figures. What were they like, we ask? These kings and barons and prelates and warriors and states, what were they really like as people? And also, we're really left just with our own imaginings to try and paint a picture. But here, these two, there's something very human, isn't there? There's something very personal. As your course at Geddington marks out the stages of that husband's grief at the beginning of 17 long years of belief and widowhood. Now, I believe that when we think about the great people of the past, it's valuable to try and see if their story has some story for us, so that it isn't just a matter of looking into the past, but finding something for ourselves in the present. And I think we can take something of this to ourselves, because <coughs> it raises the issue how we all live both personal lives and public lives, all of us. And it raises the issue of the relation between the two. <coughs> Edward and Eleanor's story illustrates this very vividly. Edward was one of the great English kings, one of the great figures in the public life of this country. But he also had what I think is a very personal gift. And that was the gift of being able to learn. He was able to listen and to learn. He learnt very importantly from the mistakes that had been made by his father, Henry III, that you can't rule without some measure of popular consent. Henry III had tried to do that. He learnt from that, and it can't be done. He ruled, of course, as the kings did, in consultation with the barons and the prelates and the judges. But he also regularly called together the representatives of ordinary people. In fact, he was sowing the seed of what we now call the House of Commons. And this not just to get the money he needed for war and peace to rule England, but as G.M. Trevelyan, the historian, puts it so well, he gathered together the petitions and grievances of his subjects so as to be able to govern in accordance with real local needs and to keep a check on the misdeeds of local officials. 
Now, I'm not saying that his happy marriage was the result of this very human and personal attitude of his. But surely there must be some connection between that and the heart that knew such tenderness and such constancy all those years, with Eleanor always at his side. So we have a picture of public authority being exercised with personal awareness. It may seem a big jump from Edward and Eleanor to ourselves, but the fact is we all have public and personal side to our lives. <coughs> I suppose the ordinary people tend to think of ourselves as spectators of the public and political scene, something that we watch on television and chat about afterwards. But it isn't really so, because each of us is part of public opinion. And public opinion is the gut feeling about things of the mass of the people, which from time to time comes together and coheres and speaks its mind and is a very, very important ingredient in the political process. Indeed, in our country, by law, we recognize this every five years, only by having a general election, which gives public opinion a chance to speak its mind. And politicians and governments have to take this seriously, because that is where their votes lie, which give them authority and power and provide them with opportunity and with guidance and with warning. And in the end, this mysterious thing we call public opinion is us, us. Since this is so, it means that it plays an important part in what happens. And that means that each one of us has a real responsibility a real responsibility to think about things, and to care about things, and to mind about things in the political scene around us, as much as we can. Now, probably for most of us, for most of us, this won't mean trying to master the details and complexities of actual political issues the very, very complicated details of what happens to the National Health Service, of what happens to education, of what happens to housing, of what happens to economy. But I think we can at least mean, it can at least mean something like this for us. One of the secrets of political life is trying to keep the balance between what is efficient and what is humane trying to keep the balance between what is efficient and what is humane. You can see this in the story of Edward I. He knew he wouldn't govern efficiently for his own purposes as King of England unless he paid attention to the needs and the feelings in some degree of ordinary people. That's to say, unless his rule was in some sense humane. And he also knew that rule would not be efficient and meet their needs unless he set, that would not be humane and meet their needs, unless he set up an official system of law under which people could live well and under which he could govern well. To be efficient, he needed to be humane, and to be humane, he needed to be efficient. And that is always a factor in political. We can see this issue of balance, the balance between what is efficient and what is humane, in our own times. I think we can see swings in public opinion which felt the balance hadn't been really kept from time to time. For instance, in 1945 general election, I would see a swing in the direction of what was humane. And in the 1979 general election, a swing in the direction of what was efficient. And indeed, in a caricature sense, conservative governments are sometimes criticized for being efficient but not humane, and labor governments are sometimes criticized for being humane but not efficient. Good governments of either party have been good exactly in proportion 
as they have got this balance right. I think each of us can watch over things in terms of this balance, can feel for it in what is going on. And insofar as we do, we will really make a contribution to a healthy, alert, enlightened public opinion and play a real part in the fortune of our land. And surely in the end, this can be seen as part of our Christian calling. For to love one's neighbor as oneself is to be concerned as much for what is humane for others as for what is efficient for our own interests. And to love God is to recognize that this balance in human affairs is part of his benevolent purpose for us all, towards which his spirit is always available to guide us as we make our way. <coughs> Your cross here at Geddington doesn't only speak of Edward and Eleanor and their love. It tells us also that as we live our personal and our public lives, we need to give as well as to get. And that bearing the risks and costs of that is the way to making sense of life for ourselves and for others and for the world. Amen. Yes. 
not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> we now have prayers of thanksgiving. We thank God for all the blessings of this life. As a village, we give thanks to God for all the blessings of this past week. We give thanks for all that we have learned about our village heritage. We give thanks for the community spirit of these past weeks and months. We give thanks for all that we have gained through our working together. We give thanks that we have been able to give pleasure to so many people. We give thanks for our village family. And we give thanks that once in the times past, King Edward and Queen Eleanor touched the life of our village. And we give thanks for all that this means to us now. And we pray that these blessings may be to us a foundation as we face life in the future we may have hope and confidence. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. At this time when we've been sharing the grief of King Edward, we pray for all those who help are bereaved. We pray now for our loved ones departed, especially those who have lived in this village and worshipped in this church. And we pray that when death comes, we may all rest in eternal peace in God's presence. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life until the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore.
cross during the singing of this hymn. And there a wreath will be laid on Queen Eleanor's cross, and it's going to be laid by baby Eleanor Hawkins. And the reason I've asked her, or her mother, to lay it on her behalf is that she's the only baby this year to be baptised with the name Eleanor, which in itself is something to be thankful for. She was also the youngest person in the cast during the pageant. And I think in years to come, the memory, which you may not have, will be told about and will be part of this village. And so there's a lot to be thankful for there. We're going to process down. The choir will lead, followed by the cast, and then I'll be with the bishop. And then, Mr. Mayor, please, would you for the worship, would you follow us? And then everyone in the congregation, please follow us down to the cross. At the end of the blessing, after the blessing, the refreshments are available in the village hall. And it would be lovely to see you all down there for just a few moments when we can say some words of thanks. But now we stand to sing the hymn, Part of the Sound of Holy Voices.
was written by Richard Roller, who was born 10 years after Queen Eleanor died. Jesus, receive our hearts and bring us to thy love. All our desire thou art. Kindle fire within us, that we may win to thy love and see thy faith in bliss, which shall never cease in heaven with never an ending. Amen. 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 Christ, the Son of Righteousness, scatter the darkness from before your path, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.